Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Great. And here we are again. Unbelievable that it's already 3.30. I don't know it's what nuts. happened to the day, right, Hamdan? It's flying. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is a very special one. Um, we have uh, Andre Musgrove on the stage. I think for me this is a special one because we've been to the Bahamas so many times, but you are, in my opinion, the only real like native Bahamian guy doing this on that professional uh, level. Thanks. Like, why are there not like more? I mean, if I would have like these conditions in my backyard, I would like think that like everybody oh, yeah. would go in the ocean. But sometimes when we're there, the people are really, you know, kind of scared of the exactly. ocean. Sometimes, what, yeah. What's going on? Uh, the thing is, in the Bahamas, like a lot of Bahamians, they grow up with a fear of the water, just because their parents couldn't swim or their grandparents couldn't swim. And despite us having like clear water, crystal clear water, is like the most to me like one of the most attractive waters where it doesn't look scary people still have this fear just because of what they were told from their elders and people look up to their elders as the wise person so don't go in the ocean don't tick, like stick your toe in the water or a shark will bite you that's generally like the perception of a lot of young Bahamians and Bahamians now so that's one of the reasons i think there's a big factor crazy you are a filmmaker <clears throat> a photographer a pretty wake creative uh, mind Thanks. and maybe i don't know who is not aware of who, who you are. There's actually a, a film that we would like to show first. Okay. And after that, we go a little bit deeper into what's going on. And we also premiere uh, your latest film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Child of really the good. Cenotes is yeah. a pretty good one. I've seen it before. So stay tuned. But we start with a little bit, you know, introduction about who you actually are. Cool. This is me and Daddy. Daddy. Daddy, look at the camera. And me, I, we just do a video log so that we can remember this time. Anyway, see you later on the island. Being born and raised in the Bahamas was no coincidence for me. Growing up, I would enjoy spending hours on end in the water. No matter if it was just a pool or the ocean, it's the place I enjoyed being the most. When I was younger, most kids my age would look forward to the weekends to play video games or be in the computer, but I'd be longing for the weekends off from school to go spearfishing with my dad in the waters around my island. As I got older, I started thinking about what kind of career path I was going to take. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. The only thing I knew for sure is what I love to do. photographer and filmmaker is a great career, but also a great responsibility. It's a responsibility to show the true nature of the underwater world, since so many persons won't ever get to see it in their lifetime. I feel a lot more comfortable being underwater than I do on land. On land, everything is noisy and congested and tense, but being underwater, it's like an escape from it all. 
I hope that through my work, I can encourage others to learn more about the ocean and what they may not understand, so they may come to love it as much as I do. And to be honest with myself, it's a bit difficult sometimes to differentiate between work and play, because I would do the same thing for both. Whether I'm on the computer editing for hours or shooting underwater photos and film, there's no other place I'd rather be. think you have found your passion, I think it's completely natural to still ask yourself, is this the right decision? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? And I feel like that can be easily answered by asking yourself, is there anything else you'd rather be doing? You know, <clears throat> I'm really jealous. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, we're from Germany or even Bangladesh or somewhere else. I mean, this is happening like really just around where you live. Yeah. This backyard. Yeah, this is your backyard. This is not, it's not fair, just to make that clear. It's not fair. Now, as, as we can see, there's a lot of uh, free diving. Uh, yes. going on. Is that what you usually uh, do most of the time or you also do scuba diving sometimes? I do mostly free diving. Like I do scuba sometimes. I'm a scuba instructor, but I don't scuba dive as often just because I feel like free diving is less requirements of equipment, a lot, like especially with already having a lot of camera equipment. Um, eliminating the scuba aspect of it, it gives you more freedom. Also, it's better when interacting with animals or for me, even having like, a lot to do in one day, you don't have to worry about switching tanks or switching gears. Like you get up on the boat, you ride out, you, go, you drop right down and it's basically just like that. So it's quicker and a little bit more flexible, I guess you can say. Uh, so you're like a free diving photo video machine. That's a pretty good thing because we're gonna ask you a few questions <laughs> about uh, free diving and things that we have from the community. But there's also okay. another aspect that is really uh, interesting. <clears throat> you know, nowadays everybody tries to be seen with what everybody does. We have Instagram, Facebook, and all of that. Um, and uh, I think there's also one aspect that is really interesting about what you do, because you're quite successful on like, promoting uh, your work through social media. Yeah. Um, and I think this is also something that uh, our community is really curious about, because even though you don't have like, a large following, there's still things that you can do in a specific way to actually you know, let more people see what you're doing. So we thought... Exactly. We take the opportunity that we have a premiere from you, which is really cool that we are able to actually show this film for the first time uh, online now. Yeah, thanks. And then we would like to dig in a little bit about what went along the process doing it also on social media to give a little bit of an insight yes. of what actually uh, went on there and how you did that and why it was working and how it was working. Cool. So, yeah. have a look. This is a premiere child of the cenotes obviously not shot in uh, the bahamas <laughs> no we don't have any of those over where there where did you go for that we were in mexico yeah all the cenotes around not all but cenotes around there for sure okay so have fun guys this is the premiere sweet <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the freediving performance by Steph and Sabine, they're sitting uh, right here. Amazing yeah. girls. <laughs> cool. Wow. That was I impressive. Mean, everybody's basically open to interpret by themselves, you know, what it is about. What is it, what is it about for you? For me, the film Tower of Sonote is about self-discovery. So it's about finding yourself in your lowest moments and coming back from that, basically. Being free of the burdens that you learned and being free of everything that got you to that point. So that you, it's a basically a free start, a fresh start to fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, I, I know how it always starts. You have these kind of things in your head. Then you make a, you have the idea, you make a script, and then, yeah. and then the whole journey starts. Yeah. So what was the whole journey about? I mean, filming this in Mexico, you know, with hanging mirrors in the cenotes and things like this is probably not the easiest uh, task to do. Mm, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what was the main challenge uh, there to do that? The main challenge was, I'd say, time for, for that. It took us, we were there on location to shoot shoot that film uh, for, I think, 10 days. Um, ten, we were there for 10 days. We shot for seven days, I think. And also, it was just the logistical part of everything was done freediving. Everything was done in brothel, so there was like no scuba equipment involved. And also, the fact that basically, when I was trying to come up with the ideas or talking with my team about the ideas and all that kind of stuff, we were simply going based off references from photos on Google of how places look. Like I'd never been there mm -hmm. before. I'd never really seen that many videos of it before. And so it was like going there and I have an, an idea of a shot list in mind, but then we go there and be like, okay, well, we want, we want something like this. Like where in, the, in Mexico, <laughs> in which one of the 300 or 3,000 cenotes do we have something that looks like this that we can actually access, that is available, that's not too deep, that's like a lot of things, and then basically work with what we have, but also it, it involves a lot of pre-planning to get to that point to do that. So you come there with a specific idea and then you look for the place that is matching your idea? Basically, I have a general idea of how, the cenote, how some cenotes look, and I try to get the names of them and go from there. But then usually it's like you see other stuff when you actually go and you're in the water looking around. And so a lot of those things still change from what I had in mind because I saw something I was like, oh, that's cooler than what I had in mind because I didn't even know that was there. What, what is your biggest takeaway from this project? From this project? Um, Biggest takeaway I feel is something like that's always been important to me before is teamwork. Having a good team to get something done and having people, especially like, for example, Sabine and Steph, like they're in the cenotes where we're used to diving a lot warmer water, where they're in like spring suits, super cold, like freezing their butts off. And <laughs> like everybody else in the team also like not used to that kind of cold water. but having them being able to trust in the vision and be able to trust in me at least for this idea that it, it will be worth it. It'll be worth all this pain, no. all this struggle and like skipping the meals and we're in the water for like six hours straight, like from when we get up to when we go to sleep, like no lunch and then like mashing down a bunch of food when we got back home and doing that the next day and the next day and the next day. And then we got like air infections from the cenotes also like from some of them because of the silt and working through all those stuff and having a limited amount of time and be able to pull it off i think teamwork is super important because i couldn't have done it without having i couldn't have done it by myself like all those kind of things yep. so yeah, that's really important to me there's two things i noticed like one thing is dealing with the light because i think the light conditions in the cenotes change by the by the time of the day, exactly. right? Like if you want to have that nice beam coming down and the nice reflection in the end in the, in the mask, there's probably yeah. not a lot of time yeah. to actually practice and do that. No. Is that, uh, of course, it's a stupid question. It's not by accident. I mean, you, you, like, you play with this light signal and you also like, be there at the right time, at the right place to actually yeah. have the, the right lighting. Yeah, so for, the, for this film, we had to time everything around, all the cenotes based on time of light for the sun rays. Um, 
for the last scene with the light beam coming down, obviously to be there between like 11 or 1 o'clock with, with the sun is straight above shining down. And for the others, similar timing. So it's like some cenotes are like three minutes from the others, some are like three hours. And like depending on what we know we need to accomplish, that was a big factor on just the time of day when we can go there and how to get there and all those kind of stuff. And there's also one thing I noticed. You didn't really use any slow motion on this one. No, not really. This no. is really cool because yeah. it's a very easy thing to, you know, shoot double the frame rate and mm -hmm. make everything more. I, I really like that there's a kind of authentic uh, feel of the normal speed of all the yeah. movements and things like that. It goes way more into, like, acting and actually, like, planning things than just rather play some nice slow yeah, motion yeah, sure. and things and then get some effects uh, from that. So I think... Yeah. Thanks. Interesting. Let's look a little bit behind the scenes in terms of uh, the accompanying um, social media. We can't really say social media campaign, but like yeah. it's an organic, organically what you do. You know, when you when you do that, I noticed that uh, pretty early that you are very active on uh, most of all uh, Instagram. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about like what is your mindset when you start something like this. Um, how do you, like what is your what is your mind how do you actually capture things beforehand and and choose what do you show the people that follow you to maybe i don't know get them interested in the final product and kind of build a, some sort of momentum or something yeah. like this. I, you were kind enough to give us some of your stories that we can uh, show here this is what, what what do we see here so this is the first story on the trip um it's called a boomerang that's why it's like the same video back and forth uh, it's basically the, me going to Mexico. That's the clip from that's the being recorded of Steph and I when we <laughs> landed. And anybody who knows me, I'm a big fan of coconuts, <laughs> um, being in the Bahamas and all that kind of stuff. And then just what I try to do through my stories is tell a story. Like that's that's how I look at it basically. So even though um, stories only stay up for like 24 hours and then they delete, it's showing people like live, this is what's happening. And this is what's going on. This is when we went to the first Sunote with our guys from Kook's Adventure. Uh, so you, so you, you basically take the people who see this on Instagram, you take them with you and every crucial thing that happens, you're gonna put a little story out so that the people can see what's going on with these guys. And maybe, you know, when they see your little uh, thumbnail there, they say like, oh, let's check in and see what Andrew does and how, how it goes. Yeah, basically. It's like, a, it's like a live behind the scenes as things are happening. And like, it's difficult when, uh, since we're shooting underwater, it's like to post stories or shoot the stories underwater and then today. post them. So that's usually like the gap like the that's kind of missing. But there's also like a part that is, is it, it builds up anticipation basically to show like this was done this is what we were trying to do and then the underwater part is what you have to wait for and builds up anticipation for when it comes out so that, that's that's my do you think like i it. see you tag a lot of um, you know like you you reference a lot of um you know other instagram accounts uh, in it why, why did you do that so f from from top to bottom, what I do for the location, as in say, for example, Cenote Car Wash and this one, it is a geotag. So on social media, people can search this geotag, and especially on Instagram now, people use these tags, whether it's geotag, hashtag, or just Instagram tags to find where they should go when they want to go to these places. So if they search um, cenote car wash on Mexico and then the post of my story will post will show up underneath this basically a list of other people who've tagged it and so it basically exposes it to more people to see that okay they click on this and they're like oh this is cenote car wash this is whatever this place I have tagged this is Mexico this is what I can do and also from that I can track backtrack to my actual okay social so media. it works in both ways you yeah, see it exactly. in the story and you end up at the place or you see it somewhere tagged on the place and then you end up that you've been there doing that exactly ah, okay okay and then with the with the name there, Kook's Adventure, that was the dive shop that we collaborated with to basically, they were our guides for this trip. So they helped us a lot with the pre-planning and the logistical part of finding the cenotes, um, having the proper guides to get us there and everything that we could have done, we couldn't have done because they're the local experts on scene. So do they appreciate that you do that? Like, do they ask you for that or you just do that because you're a nice guy? That's, that's the part. Well, <laughs> I do it. I like, I would do it anyway, but as a part of the deliverables between our, our agreement and our collaboration, that we 
it was a, like somewhat of a social media collaboration or campaign kind of, if what you want to call it, where exchange of services based on who can benefit from what or who, what you would like to benefit for. So for us, it was like Instagram posts, Instagram stories, to, uh, a certain amount or, and the, the film actually was, wasn't like in the original plan, but it was for me, for me, that was like a bonus because that's exactly what I came there to do and mentioning them like in the credits and all that kind of stuff is more exposure for their company, more exposure for their brand so people see this and especially in the stories they can show that we are here with them because of them and people can check out, okay, I want to go to Mexico, please, if I follow Andre, I follow Sabina, whatever, these are the people, this is the company that I might want to go with because I saw what they did. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the idea of... Instagram, but I assume Instagram this uh, project is not like uh, funded or anything. This is more like a free project that you were doing and you're yes. trying to get some uh, assistance and help and support from different you know, partners to do that. Correct. And then work together on social media. Do you think that kind of works? Like, do you think there's a, like, they're happy with that and they say, like, okay, we provide a lot of the logistics and we're happy with you to tag that? Or, because I think a lot of people overestimate this ability to do yes. that. Like, yeah. What is your feeling about it? My, my feeling about it is like yes, yes. back in the day, people would put a lot of money into social media campaigns which requires like, let's say flying in models, flying in photographer, flying in all these things, hiring like a social media expert and having a team of like 20 people basically to what people are doing now on Instagram where one person can reach, like for example, with this story was viewed 3,000 times basically by the people who follow my account. So all these are potential clients, all these potential guests, all these potential fans for whoever is involved in the social media. Even the same thing with the Instagram posts. When people check it out, it's like, it, it's basically this, this almost like using the same budget that people did before for huge campaigns that require like print media and all that kind of stuff for Instagram that could almost reach just the amount of people or more depending on the niche and depending on the person that you use. Are you see yourself doing more of this and, and, and advance more of this? Is, is it like, like, like your um, way into the future to be like even more visible on Instagram and build that account to have it like as a foundation to found and uh, help to get your stuff done? Yeah, yeah, for me, for me I, I, I only use social media like for, as, as a business aspect of it. I look at it as an asset to help my business, to help my brand. Personally, like it, with, without that, I don't think I would be on social media because either way, I'm usually underwater anyway. I'm not going to post anything while being wet. <laughs> so for me, it's, uh, it, it helps a lot and also helps to connect with like a bunch of people from around the world. Like even not even looking from an aspect for business, just connecting with people who have other interests similar to like how we met basically or learning all about other people's work from seeing what you're doing and also having that personal digital personal connection through Instagram or social media where you kind of feel like you know them and then when you meet them in person it's kind of like a hey buddy like we talked a few times like we know each other and then basically like making a relationship more solid. That's a very positive aspect of uh, social media. I think there's also a um, yeah do, can you think of any negative aspects? I don't know it's not a very popular question <laughs> but I mean I think what we do on social media also kind of makes people feel bad because they think we have like an amazing life and do a lot of things and they stuck at home and yeah. stuff like that. Is that an, an issue sometimes? I think, I mean, you're, you're quite open. You also show like funny things and things that don't go well and stuff like yeah. that. Do you think that is important to show the side as well? I think it's the thing about social media and just life on the whole for me. And I, I encourage for other people also just to be natural, basically, like to be yourself. So like for me personally, I don't really care to show if like, for example, if I make a mistake or like us like looking at like our worst after doing something, because that's a part of the story. Like that's a part of what really happened. I think the bad thing, the negative thing in some aspects of a social media is a lot of people tend to compare themselves to other people, like depending on the needs. So like a, like a fashion model or athlete or something like that, where it's a lot of comparison, where that's usually the case, but it also can be looked at as a, as a motivation. Like I would like, to learn how to do this, or I would like to travel to this place instead of looking into where, oh, I wish I could have done this, my life is so horrible, blah, blah, blah. You can use it as motivation to help boost what you want to do or what you would like to accomplish in a healthy way. Okay, cool. Um, this is really nice. 
that you send us actually your some of your stats. Thanks. Um, as we can see, <coughs> uh, Instagram is one of your like, is like the main channel that you are working on, right? Yeah. I think yeah. everything else is little little bit below that. Okay. So what do we see here? Like this is what you basically get when you do things. Uh, is it? Do you only get these kind of um, statistics when you like boost things and put a little bit of money on it, or is this just what you can? access in your insights on your Instagram page to see how your thing's been received? Yeah, so these these insights here, well, from this way, this way, um, just the amount of followers on my current Instagram, Facebook followers, YouTube subscribers, and then over here is just, this information is only available to each account, like to your own personal account, so this is my account, obviously. Um, showing the audience of the amount of fo the amount of followers I had, um, the top locations and top countries that most of the people follow me from. So like, United States is 30% of the people who follow my work on on Instagram specifically. This is only Instagram insights, and then second is Brazil and then Italy, and then over there is age range. So most of the People who follow me are between the ages of 25 to 34. 45% is almost half, it's like around that age. And the gender for the people who follow me is 50-50. So it's like I men think that's and pretty women cool. equally. Yeah, I think that's really, really cool. I mean, the, the people that follow you the most are even a little bit older than you. They're probably yeah. as old as people think you are. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Do you know, if we look at our statistics, <laughs> when we see Brazil, like the second populist, group yeah. that follows us is the people from Bangladesh because we have uh, Hamdan as yeah. the, lo the local hero there. They mess yeah, exactly. up all our statistics <laughs> because people then think, ah, oh, Bangladesh, you've basically just been buying the land. Yeah. But said, no, no, we had, this guy is uh, responsible for it. Yeah. So, so, you can, so this is obviously a, a very important tool to actually when you like reach out to partners to basically have something to show. Exactly. Because I mean, you know how it is. Uh, you know, I promote you on Instagram. I want something for free for you, and then a lot of people got to see it. And, 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 and. so yeah. this is this is one tool to actually be able to show what is happening. Yeah. Um, really cool. I think it's really cool, especially because it goes out to the more like younger or upcoming people, yeah. ocean people, when they are really you know can be um, actually effective and active, and also start you know basically I think 25, 34 is when they graduated or when yeah. they like, get into their jobs and exactly. this is also something they can yeah. in the middle of their life being able to do things and be connected to this kind of group I yeah. think is a very good very good thing and also with these statistics it's, it's similar to the results you would see like for example or they use the example of like a marketing campaign with a lot of things this is similar to what you would use or you would, you would get back after that so this is like where would I want to put my ads for my company? Or where would I want to put my ads for myself to target the right people? And with these insights, um, partners, potential partners or clients or whatever can see where the investment may actually go. So it's like, yeah. I want to target the United States market. Then you find somebody, if you have similar stats, like this would be, United States would be good. I want to tar target more males or more females, then you'll be able to tell that based on someone's social media statistics. And the same thing for age group, like which, what type of people am I trying to connect with most? Uh, young people, older people, and you can go from there basically. And also seeing the results of how other posts have done. That's the, the post over here. So this is just impressions where it's basically how many people, impressions of how many people the posts did reach and could have reached, basically, so in order of um, highest to lowest. Like so everybody who had your photo on the screen has one count? Yes, basically. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Sure. Interesting. Let's see a little bit more Very of your work, yeah. what you're doing. I think we have a few different uh, examples because you're not only in a really cool filmmaker guy, but you're also a photo Thanks. guy. Right, and there are a few. Um, I think there's a few photos that stick out um, exceptionally. Let's uh, have a look at this one. Why is this? Um, this is um, Steph, by the way. Yep. Yeah. Sitting I right didn't know there. you can play the piano. <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> Sounded a little bit bubbly. <laughs> um, why is this a special photo for you? And, and, and in what sense is it a special photo? So this particular photo is special to me because it's, uh, well, to give a background where it is, is it's in, uh, in Exuma, one of the islands in the Bahamas. And it's uh, an underwater statue, of course. 
um, by the artist Jason DeClaris Taylor. It was a gift by, well, he got commissioned by David Copperfield as a gift to his girlfriend um, for their statue, basically, and they're able to share it with the rest of the world by putting it underwater and accessible to everybody. So this one belongs to David Copperfield? Yes. Wow. He commissioned the huh. artist to, to make that. That's awesome. I'm not, I can't remember how long it's been there, but I remember, um, I don't know, back in, 2012, 2014, I saw a picture of it. It's just before I even, even really knew what I wanted to do. I saw a picture of it. I was like, ah, oh, that's super cool. Like, I, I would like to go there and do something cool. That's all I, that's as far as I thought, basically. And at that time, and when I had the opportunity to make this photo with my friend Steph, it was, it's kind of like a, a vision, it's almost like deja vu. Like I know I wanted to do something before, but it wasn't on my mind like forever. And then the opportunity came up to do it. And I was just like, I really would like to execute this photo almost just as well as I had back in when I first thought of it, basically. So for me, it's kind of just like a long-term dream come true in a way. And then able the photo to do went it. on a journey? Yes. So this, we actually shot this photo while we were doing a, a segment for a news, com, a news network called TF1 in France. And this was one of the, they, they basically were following us around that day to show like behind the scenes of what we're doing. So the story, the photo has a story behind it in that aspect. And just from the social media aspect of this photo also is probably, is my most viewed post or most viewed um, photo. Cause we also did a quick video, like 15 second video of Steph playing the piano underwater. And people really went crazy for that on social media. <laughs> cool. Seems like this is your signature photo of yourself. Is that yourself? No, that's my friend David. Yeah. Ah, that's damn it. Mean. It looks a little, little bit like you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, how did you do that photo? Like, of yourself? Of myself. <laughs> yes. So, Cameras floating mm. on a timer. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Basically, I threw it. It slid in position. I have like a high shutter speed just in case it turns. And then I dove down <laughs> and the eagle ray, I called it over. And then it's one yeah. pass. Okay, amazing. That's, that's the short version. <laughs> if you live in the Bahamas, you have Eagle Razor's friends. <laughs> that's really nice. Hey, let's, let's go and answer a few uh, questions that uh, we got from the community that are basically tailor-made for you. At least that's what Sonia told, tells me. So let's see what's this one. What would be the difference between recording in scuba and freediving? Yeah, this is totally your alley. So the difference between recording recording in scuba or free diving i think in in order is buoyancy because with scuba you have a bcd and you can control the buoyancy and free diving you have your lungs so you control how much you float or sink based on one how much weight you wear how much air you take in how deep you want to go so for example if you're free diving you to whatever depth to record, whatever you want to do, you kind of have to gauge how much air you want in your lungs based on how much weight you have so you don't float too much or so you don't sink too much. Also, depending on the shot you want. So that's buoyancy. Another thing is stabilization. Um, between If you're wearing scuba fins for scuba diving, it's, for me, a little bit easier to record stuff while free diving, with, also with free diving fins, because it's you don't have that extra piece of equipment on you to throw you off balance, basically. It's just you, your fins, going wherever you need to go or staying upright without having to compensate with like a tank on your back. And then for recording animals between scuba diving and free diving, I personally think free diving is better because you don't have the bubbles as an aspect to maybe scare the animals away or you'll be able to go into position better um, to record the animal or be as quiet as possible or less invasive and possible in the water in order to get close to that animal or for that animal more so to get close to you. Yeah, I heard yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really like that <laughs> because I'm so bad at free diving. It's, it's pretty <laughs> cool to learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to show me. He's slowly <laughs> getting there. He's slowly yeah. getting there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like an example for this photo, kind of would have been impossible to shoot this on scuba on that particular day because of, I, I, if you notice the waves at the surface or the water break, that's probably, it's an underwater cave in Nassau, the island that I live in. And the free divers are my friend Johnny and Sophia. They are like 
um, national record professional freediver is champions. Is that Sofia Uribe from what is it? Yeah, Colombia. Yeah, uh, awesome. Sofia Gomez from Colombia. Colombia. Yeah, okay. and that was an extremely rough day uh, with this cave where it's high tide. Basically, the water fills up the cave. Uh, when it's low tide, the water has speed from the ocean to rush straight to the back of the cave, and that's what happened in this. So basically, we were diving in like the surge tunnel basically just to get we swim like 20 seconds under um under the cave to get to this entrance and then in order for them to be orientated like that um against the waves against the a current against the tide also with me i might have been upside down on this photo actually when i shot it just so i can use my fins on the waves to like help brace myself to stay in the same place uh, with scuba equipment it would have been really difficult because i would have been like all over the place, tanks going everywhere, and a lot more difficult basically than freediving, where I could have just kind of like escaped really quickly. See, guys, there's always a huge effort hidden behind yeah. the photos that for you see. Sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. This one also shot freediving, as in I was freediving, and of course, the models were freediving. And this one was probably one of my first photos similar to the style that I do more of now, where I shot this back in, I think, January 2017 or 2018. And for me, it's a very special photo because it, it kind of was the photo that I shot. I kind of feel like encouraged me to know what I wanted to do next or like the kind of the thing what I wanted to do next. And I'm a pretty big fan. I've been a big fan of superheroes, so like with how I um, direct the models or the composition of like that hero look kind of uh, showing off the models and the people doing the thing in the marine environment is usually what I try to go for in some ca in most cases. Cool. So that's what I tried for in this photo particularly. Cool. Can you still recover the colors when diving beyond 15 meters or 20 meters, no strobes, no video lights. The reason I ask is that I shoot in the shallows only 5 to 15 meters via free diving with just ambient light. I'm curious to know what happens with the colors when it is deeper. Can I still recover at post? So... I think, is that a photo question? I think it's... I think it's yeah. maybe both. But they also mentioned They said no video, video light. light. John. So I think if you're free diving just another I'm I'm curious to know what happens with the plus when you go. So when you go when you go deeper in underwater photography, uh you lose the colors um RGB biv. And so you lose the color red first. And so when you go deeper you start you lose red first and you lose more and more colors as you go deeper. So it would change as you go deeper from, for example, if you set the custom white a manual white balance as in telling the camera, okay, this is white by using your uh, white slate or for me, I use my hand or I use the sand. Usually I'm in water that has that kind of sound, that kind of depth. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> white sand, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so I just, I just shoot a picture of that basically at whatever depth I want to shoot in not in the depth of water that I am in. So I know if I want to go down to 15 meters, I will go to 15 meters and set the white balance Does down there. Does it matter even if you shoot in raw? Pardon? Does it matter even if you shoot in raw? It depends. I mean, I think, it, I think it matters because it's what I try to do and how I shoot is try to shoot the photo as close as possible to what you want the final product to look like for two reasons. I think it's really good practice. And also second, you save a lot of time in post. So yeah. you, you basically give yourself more time to move on to something else if you don't have to fight around with like lighting or col colors is like a big deal, especially for underwater photography. So, so yeah, we yeah. can say it can be recovered. If yes. you do yeah, it can, nice be, it can be recovered in post. Raw. Yes. Okay. Cool. Oh, this is a really nice one here. Uh, this photo was shot... Um, on the off day that we had during shooting, while shooting Child of Cenote. Uh, on that day, because of the still water and some of the cenotes and no much, not much circulation, you can get air infections in there. So Sabine, the main model for, that, for the film, was out for that day in order for us to shoot the other days. So Johnny, who is the safety diver for us, the same person in the other photo with Sophia, um, and I basically went 
to still use the time of that day or those days to shoot in a quite different environment that we're both used to diving and that we're both used to shooting in. And uh, this was a stalag, stalagmite or stalactite. It, it, was a, it was almost a column basically before the cave filled up with water and one of the cenotes in Mexico. And uh, the column, well, the structure is about 30 feet tall and the water itself is around like 40 feet maybe. Super yeah. nice. I think we have to make a decision here because of absolutely no sweat that we make a little bit longer because I think we have a lot of uh, more things. We also have yeah. a few more uh, videos that we want to or could watch. I just have to check this one. There's a lot of more questions. This talk is also flying by. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's see. Should we like watch a video in between? Pardon? Watch a video in between? Sure. I think we should. The Bimini story, anything about this one that you want to share? Yeah, I think something's in there. Yeah. You want to say something about it or we just play it? Yeah, um, I, I talk, I actually talk in this video, so <laughs> I think it's easy that way. This is the Bimini story. Oh, okay. After my most recent dive trip to Grand Cayman, free diving with some members of the diving community there, including my friend Jason, he was able to show me around some of the best diving spots in Grand Cayman, and now I want to check out my side of the ocean, in the Bahamas, with hopes of swimming with the famous Great Hammerhead Sharks of Bimini. So we called up our friends, Steph and Ivan, to join us on this last minute adventure, with a two day window of calm weather before a storm rolling in, and no set itinerary, we set out on our two-day mission to Bimini. So we should, get, we should get off the boat. <laughs> Are you telling us to get off your boat? Yeah, get off, get in the water. Man said get off the boat. Why, get in the water. Why you come out? <laughs> going to dive in Neil Watson today. We're going to go at the Hammerhead Shark site. We're going to be free diving all day. We're going to shoot all day. This is what we came here to do. Hopefully we're going to be able to get some dolphins in the afternoon too. The weather conditions out here are ideal. So let's see how we do today. Peace.
As a result of famous shark horror movies and reading hungry media headlines, sharks have been given a bad reputation. They have been portrayed as mindless man killers whose sole purpose is to hunt and kill us humans. These are all lies. Sharks are some of the ocean's most beautiful creatures, and despite being apex predators at the top of the ocean's food chain, they have no interest and no desire to kill and eat us humans, which should be treated with the love and the respect that they deserve. straight hours and one of the best free diving experiences of our lives. We had just one more mission to complete before leaving the moon. With another successful free diving trip coming to an end, we leave them with an even greater appreciation for a healthy ocean. By presenting content depicting sharks in a positive light, we hope to dispel the myths and change the mindset of the fearful. With everyone's help, we can all do our part to save these beautiful creatures so that they thrive and keep balance in the ocean for generations to come. Until next time, dive smart, dive safe. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty fat as grouper there behind you. Did yeah. you see that? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, you guys seem to have a lot of fun there. <laughs> Where? Uh, that, that, on that you're not aware of that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. <laughs> no, pretty cool. Hamdan. You know, I think uh, just judging from the questions, we there's no doubt you have this amazing talent when it comes to both photo, video, Thanks. and as we mentioned, also the social media. Um, when you were showing that, that was actually impressive, just to see how social media is actually a serious thing that you have to take into account. Yeah. So for someone in your sta at your level, if you were looking at someone who also wants to leverage social media, who has that creative instinct that you have, mm -hmm. what would you recommend to them when it comes to just social media? I would recommend to find out if you don't know already what your niche is and what, what you like to do more, more so than what people accept more, I guess awesome. you can say. Yeah. Because when you focus on what people accept more, you, can, you kind of just fight on people's opinions that will constantly change. Yeah. Where you use yourself as the basically the the neutral factor that okay i know yeah. this is what i like therefore this is what i will do and you you can then grow faster that way because things stay the same people who follow you will follow you for you exactly. not because yeah. of what Very you keep true. changing to adapt to yeah. so i think that would be the best advice for mm -hmm. getting into social media yeah uh, or just life <laughs> yeah very good point that's a very yeah. good point be yourself yeah yeah, yeah. and some people forget be one that with when the it comes to social media yeah. Be yeah. like Naomi. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Thanks that for having was me. impressive. I appreciate it. Really, really cool. Andre, I think we're going to see a lot more from you in the future. Yeah. I don't know. I follow you for quite a while, and yeah. the level is going up and up and up and up. Thank you. Pretty cool. Yeah. Really cool to have you here. Okay, cool. That's the last live stream for today. Tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Yes. Is wide angle Wednesday? Wednesday would be amazing, but it's actually not a wide angle Wednesday. Tomorrow we have Submaris here, the German scientific yeah. uh, divers that do amazing, cool things yeah. that you wouldn't think about. 
Alex Tattersall, I think macro photography and Andre Cas uh, Andre uh, Andre Casagrande, you know your yeah, brother? It's <laughs> a mix, it's a hybrid. Andy Casagrande is tomorrow he like shark awesome. like shark conservation filmmaking. Yep. It's, sounds like another dream job to me. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Thanks guys. See you tomorrow. Awesome. Thanks, dude. That was amazing. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it.